Good morning, everyone. Uh, my, th welcome to uh, SharePoint 2013 Branding with Design Manager. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Don Webster. I am the Director of eBusiness for Business and Decision North America. And the primary focus of eBusiness is all of our custom development around Java, .NET, SharePoint, and all the different uh, governance pieces that go along with SharePoint. So let's go ahead and jump right in and uh, take a quick look at the evolution that we've uncovered for the last uh, six years with the different versions of SharePoint. So the goal of branding is to provide a consistent look and feel throughout all of your environments and provide a consistent user experience across the board, no matter which stuff they happen to hit on SharePoint. Um, this concept really hasn't changed much through the versions of SharePoint, but the tools and techniques certainly have. So we can take a look at take a, a brief trip back, and I'm sure many of you on the call today have had your uh, your uh, interesting challenges and and battles with SharePoint 2007 and the uh, the complexity that really occurred there with branding. Um, the default methodology that people used for that back in the day was primarily hacking up the master pages using SharePoint Designer or Notepad or some other tool um, in our arsenal. And it, uh, there was a lot of experimentation, a lot of trial and error. Uh, it, it's very, it was very easy to break SharePoint 2007 when you were tweaking master pages. So um, the stuff that we've got today in 2013 is certainly a welcome change, and I'll be going through that shortly. Uh, SharePoint 2010 didn't change a whole lot. It gave you a little more sophisticated gaming engine and a few more color schemes to really kind of go out of the box, but the overall approach from 2007 didn't change much. You were still relegated to hacking up the master pages. There was another option that was a good way to do it, but it required a lot more work, and that was um, developing actual solutions that were deployed to the farm within Visual Studio, and you would wrap up all your master pages and your style sheets and everything else and your, all your HTML and everything into these solutions and deploy them out to the farm, and then you would staple them to your site templates. So it was a very good way to do things because it really reduced the breakage a lot, but it was a lot more complex because you needed somebody that knew how to do Visual Studio pretty well and then do all the packaging for the SharePoint solutions. So there was a lot more involved. It was more of a development task or a combination of a uh, developer with working with your designers. So 2013 has given us uh, uh, much higher level uh, customization options and uh, we, we're not limited to just colors today, but fonts, backgrounds, and choices between two master pages. And while the SharePoint designer is still an option, um, they've uh, made a couple changes to that that make it a little more challenging to use than the uh, SharePoint design manager. So the whole point behind your design manager was to get that WYSIWYG tool that would make things easier to uh, make those changes. So you wouldn't need a developer, per se, to actually do substantial changes to the farm. You could do it with somebody that just knew the basics of HTML and how to work within the SharePoint tools that they were providing. So um, we'll jump to the next slide. And let's talk a little bit about activating the design manager. This is actually pretty simple. Obviously, the only thing that's really uh, important to note here is that uh, you have the right permissions to do this. You need to uh, at least be an owner on your own site, and it needs to be activated at the uh, the SharePoint server level on the site collection administration stuff. So if you don't have those rights, you can certainly contact somebody within your IT organization to enable that. This doesn't make any other changes to the farm other than allowing SharePoint designer to interact and, and be available, you know, for the, the users to, to uh, manipulate. Um, one little quick note, um, lesson learned on my part, if you do activate on the site collection feature, but not the, the site feature, you can access Design Manager via the site settings page, but not the settings drop-down menu. So if you didn't have permissions correctly, that could cause a little bit of a problem. So it's just best practice to make sure you activate it in both places. So one important change to note uh, from SharePoint Designer, they actually only allow a code view today. We used to have a code and, and a design view so you could make the changes in you know, HTML 
or whatever, then flip over to the design view and it would it would show. Um, sometimes it was a little messy on the rendering and the preview part, but it, it did get the, the basic point across for the most part. You could see if your changes were going to be breaking or not. But today, that design view is gone, and, you know, the, the premise behind that is to push people to the design manager. Um, is this a good or bad thing? I don't know. It all depends on your point of view. Um, but uh, we'll definitely cover some of the gaps that we have with design manager and, you know, how we can maybe look at using both of these tools in conjunction to make sure the branding experience is, is very good a little bit later in the slide. And I have left plenty of time for questions at the end, so I'm sure some will pop up that we can go through at the end of the, at the presentation. So let's jump over to our next slide. Um, I'm going to jump in here with just a quick overview, and this is kind of a walkthrough on how to deploy your design to, uh, to SharePoint through Design Manager. So you'll see here we've got a pretty uh, simple screen. Um, it's kind of a nine steps to success, I guess, if you want to call it that. Um, they're not all required, and you likely won't use but two or three of them at the end of the day. There are more capabilities in this tool than we have time and, and you know, uh, bandwidth to go over today. But um, maybe we'll follow it up with a separate webcast in the future, just talking about design packages and different things like that that can come along with this tool. Um, let's jump on to next slide. So just a real quick overview of this before we jump into the actual uh, walkthrough on how to do this, this step. Um, on that first page, we had a, an option to create an edit or create a master page. So here we've got um, a, a quick screenshot of the tool set you're going to get when you get to the edit piece. So after we deploy our solution, uh, our HTML solution up to SharePoint and it converts it into a master page, we'll have the ability to affect that master page with this screen. So with, from this spot, you can do some basic things as I noted here in the slide. Um, you can create a minimal, minimal master page or you can convert an existing HTML design um, add everything else um, used to the master page gallery, then use this feature to convert it to a functioning master page. Um, and then most importantly, when you're working through this is just uh, the preview um, piece is very nice. Uh, once you have deployed your HTML up to the site, you'll be able to get a nice visual of, of how it's going to look um, and how it's going to function for the most part. So. After you deploy it, it's pretty static and pretty bare, and we'll cover that part with the snippets in a little bit. So folder structure, uh, this is really up to you. At the end of the day, you're, you're just referencing, you know, your, your HTML is referencing your CSS, and SharePoint is, is smart enough to figure out what you've done with the links to your HTML page that are already present. So this is just a, this is very much a preference thing. This is how I like to do mine. I, I like to do four or five different layouts and then, um, and then an images folder, a CSS folder, uh, if you've got a scripts folder, et cetera, to, to wrap all these pieces up together and keep it all in one place. So normally when I do my designs, I start with Photoshop, I do a mock-up. Well, I do wireframes at Basalmic, then we do Photoshop, then we do the mock-up. So I like to keep everything together. Any true type fonts I'm going to upload to the server, and then also my uh, the source uh, folder there is actually where my Photoshop file lives or files, depending on the on the solution and the complexity. So that way I can keep everything together for for easy reference for myself. Um, the most important thing here to remember is you need to make sure your CSS HTML is compliant, of course. Um, just your basic HTML skeleton is all required. I'm sure everybody on the call, or most of you, have uh, knowledge of what that is. You know, you're just your HTML, your body tags, et cetera, just making sure all that's complete and valid. Um, it, it, one easy thing to do is to skin it up in Dreamweaver before you actually have to uh, upload it to SharePoint. You can use whatever tool you prefer because the great thing about this way to brand SharePoint is that you don't really have to learn anything new. You don't have to really learn anything SharePoint like you did in the past and learn how to hack up a master page or learn a solution deployment. This is just using the tools you know to create the HTML that you're familiar doing and then you can have SharePoint do all the hard heavy lifting for you. So 
Simple. Uh, when you go to upload the science files, SharePoint's going to give you a URL. Um, it basically looks just about like this for the most part, whatever your basic site URL is, slash underscore catalogs and master pages. That will dump you into the folder that contains all the stuff and then just drag and drop your folder up there or just your files up there depending on how you set it up. Pretty simple to do. And after that is done, you'll be selecting convert an HTML file to a SharePoint master page. And what that does is it prompts you with a, and on the next slide, it prompts you with a pop-up window. And then basically just browse to the folder or file you just uploaded and then select your file. And you'll see here I've, I'm selecting my in, index file. And then you'll just click the insert button and It'll chew on it for a little bit. It shouldn't usually take too long unless it's a really big file. And after that's all done, you'll you'll end up here with uh, conversion successful, hopefully. If you follow the standard HTML skeleton, you I I get to see it fail, so it's unlikely that that will happen. So once this is done, you are um, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's back up for one second there. So. Once this is done, SharePoint has created a master page for you from the HTML file. Um, and you don't really need to touch that master page manually anymore. There's a way to inject the uh, SharePoint controls and uh, SharePoint-y things that we need to uh, enhance things a little further. After this step is done, your SharePoint master page is going to be next to worthless for the most part. All the stuff that you would expect, like your navigation menus, your SharePoint search boxes, all those are gone. And, and then the snippets uh, tool, which we'll go over here in just a few minutes, is going to be your avenue to actually add those pieces back into the page where they make sense. Because, you know, if you've done this right and you've, and you've planned ahead, you know where the search box is going to go. You know where your navigation is going to go. So you can drop your snippets code that the SharePoint tool is going to give you into your HTML page, and then everything will work great. On the snippets, um, this is that screen you saw earlier. Nothing much has changed, except I've uh, made a few little references to what we're looking at here. So up on the top is our snippets toolbar. There's a lot of different choices for snippets here. You'll just have to go through. There's, it's a pretty exhaustive list. Things like the navigation, the search bar, like I mentioned earlier, and along with all the other SharePoint controls. And once you've selected that snippet, um, it actually gives you a, um, you see here on the bottom left of that tool, uh, the code to copy right in and drop into your HTML page. So it made it very easy to actually get those pieces of SharePoint back into your design without uh, breaking anything. As we talked about earlier, it was very easy to break SharePoint, and it still is because those controls that are there that it injects at the initial the creation of your page are very important to make sure SharePoint render and function properly. If you go in there and start manually touching them without knowing what you're doing, it's very easy to, to bust up your, your site collection and, and render it useless or throw some yellow screens of, of death from uh, ASP.net uh, at the end of the day. So um, this is a very welcome addition. Uh, makes it very simple to drop in the pieces for you. And uh, there's uh, not really a lot else to go over here. Um, one of the things I wish we could have done is do a demo, but our provider for these webcasts does not have that capability uh, working correctly yet. So we're hoping that, that in the future that will happen, otherwise we could have gone through a demo and see how quickly and simple it is to uh, easy to do things to make those changes happen. So let's jump over to device channels and I'll be done the basic walkthrough. And obviously there's a few more options to play with there in that tool that we won't be covering today. And if anybody has any questions about those, I'm happy to take them offline uh, or maybe here at the end of the, at the call if we have time and to do all of the questions. Um, and we might follow up with a separate webcast as I mentioned earlier. So device channels are a very interesting uh, addition to SharePoint 2013. So, now that we've got HTML5, CSS3, for the most part, invading our lives on pretty much every website, at least, at least CSS3, not always HTML5, but it's becoming a lot more common. Uh, there's a lot of HTML5 in SharePoint 2013. Um, for instance, the drag and drop files to a folder uh, or a document library 
within the uh, SharePoint portal is an HTML5 tool that's, that is actually in there or a, or a piece on the canvas. So it's very handy if you, so you don't have to worry about the whole multiple file browse thing that you had to go mess with in SharePoint 2007-2010. So um, something to just think about when you are building out the inter user interfaces that you have to, you know, for your organization. Um, device channels are really about creating custom master pages that are focused on a specific um, phone or maybe just a platform like iOS because they're using whatever version of the latest WebKit is to render. I'm sure where they loaded it up in iOS 7.1 that got released, I think it was yesterday. So um, these device channels will obviously have the, uh, the user agent strings that you would expect, and then SharePoint picks those up and then renders the appropriate device channel. Um, obviously, you know, this is going to allow you to create a very good experience for that device um, when you access SharePoint 2013. And the negative is, unless they change this to Service Pack 1, I haven't had a chance to check yet, there's only 10 device channels available to you as a user. Now, um, device channels require extra time. They require administrators to set them up. We'll jump over here to a quick uh, slide with what a device channel um, screen looks like. So um, we've got to have the publishing portal set up, the publishing infrastructure feature at the site collection level has got to be set up as well as a web level. And then after you drill in to the device channel, you've got to inject your, your agent strings here, as you can see where I've got them there in the, in the device inclusion rules. And so when those agent strings are detected by SharePoint, it will render this device channel. And this is one for IE10. Obviously, there could be a Windows Phone 8 or an iPad or a you know, um, a Zoom tablet, for instance. Um, so with Android and iOS, you're probably safe with just the platform style thing, but you may have executives that have, if you, especially if you're a big BYOD shop or your own device, you're gonna, you might have some challenges with that 10 device channel limit going forward. So it's just uh, something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, one thing to think about too, and there are gaps here, obviously, especially with the number of devices you can do and the fact that it's going to require somebody to always go in and add a new device channel as new devices or platforms become available. And that may mean going back and also creating new screens, new master pages for those devices if they don't fit with a new dev a, an older device or, you know, that, that Maybe the resolution's changed enough on the smartphone where it's, uh, who knows, I'm not sure someday soon we're going to get a 4K screen with the rate of advancement we've got going with display technology on a phone. That's probably not necessarily a good thing. It probably looked really pretty, but it's not as quite as easy for um, uh, designers and developers to work with at the end of the day. So, the, and obviously we've got a, a rash of new devices coming out. It's pretty much a six-month cycle. So, you can see that this could require a little bit of care and feeding on your part or a lot, depending on your organization and strategy and, and how you actually, you know, work with the uh, the mobile device policy within the company. Um, something to think about, too, is maybe it's not device channels. Maybe we go with responsive design versus device channels. And I don't have a slide on that one. There's one more here for device channel. So after you've created and activated, you can say, hey, specify, boom, boom, boom. And your your uh, your channel will be here in the list, right? And so you can focus whatever um, you need to focus on for that particular master page you've already created for those slides. So let's leave it here for a minute and go over a couple things. I don't have slides on that I thought about last night, but I couldn't get the deck updated in time. Um, on a responsive-based design um, versus the device channels. So I would think that it's, it's going to be a little simpler out of the box to just work with the device channels. Um, injecting the responsive-based design pieces into SharePoint is going to require a little more legwork up front, actually probably quite a bit more legwork up front than it is to, but you know, you'll gain it back on not having to administer those device channels going forward for the different devices and platforms that may arise. And it will also help you simplify your master page uh, layouts, too, because you're going to be able to, you know, lay out that responsive base piece instead of a whole bunch of master pages. If you, if you do it right and, and wire up Bootstrap and get all the pieces in there, it's going to make it a little simpler, I think, for everybody going forward. And um, I think it would certainly be a lot less maintenance at the end of the day. Um, 
there are a couple of uh, nice projects going on on Clipflex uh, right now. I think one of them is called Responsive SharePoint, and there's another one called like a starter template that uh, takes everything and minifies up the stuff as well. So there's a couple of ways to to jump right in without having to do a lot of legwork, and I haven't really tested them out yet. I've been watching them evolve a little bit, but they look like they're on the right track to making things pretty easy for people to wire up the responsive designs and get all those pieces going. So then obviously, as you know, all your work is in your CSS and your app media selection and the, and the files and different things like that to make the responsive stuff work. This still doesn't remove all the testing that's going to happen for responsive-based design, which is usually pretty extensive. Um, nothing's really going to go away. Uh, it's just um, probably a, a, a good way to look at uh, filling in the gaps that are offered by the design channels, or excuse me, device channels today, and certainly a, a worthy um, effort on your part to, to explore both options and see which ones can fit best for your organization. And one other thing to think about for, from a branding perspective, and it's, it's more from a performance, but it'd also be helpful for a maintenance thing for everybody. Um, the SharePoint CSS files are, they're, well, they're, they're pretty massive. Um, the core uh, V15 CSS file that ships with SharePoint, and it may have more after Service Pack 1, had almost 14,000 lines of code in it. It was a little extensive, and when you start digging through it, you'll see all, and obviously SharePoint's a massive product, so I can see the reason behind it, but there was a lot of stuff left over in there from SharePoint 2010. Um, still not sure why all that was there, but it is, and it's probably needed on certain levels to do certain things within different uh, sites and different pieces like wiki libraries and things like that. Um, so something that's uh, worthy of your time and consideration is to minify those CSS files because they are pretty big. And if this is going to be a pretty heavy mobile thing for your organization, then that's going to be, need to be downloaded twice by the phone. So um, minifying that would be a, a very worthy goal. And there is a um, project already in the way on CodePlex called uh, SP Blueprint, if memory serves right. And that is publicly available, and they've actually already minified all 16 CSS files for you. So the, I, if I remember correctly on the, on the, uh, on the minification, it actually dropped um, about it was either 10 or 11,000 lines of code off of the primary core V15 CSS file. So it was a pretty substantial reduction in the size of the file, and that'll help uh, your mobile performance as well. So um, certainly something to think about, and we can always uh, add some links to our webcast to get to these pieces that I'm mentioning here and stuff today. Um, so that was primarily my uh, presentation. I see we have one question here. And let's see, is it the same in Office? The question is, is it the same in Office 365? So with the design stuff, the tool works exactly the same in the cloud or on-premise. In fact, I'm sure that with the cloud uh, direction that Microsoft is taking the company and everything, that the design manager was built to facilitate designing and branding in the cloud to make things easier. Because typically uh, developers are the guys that do it for the on-premise stuff because there's already a team on the ground and they already have pretty good knowledge of the farm and how all that stuff works. But this allows um, to say your, your standard business user that happens to know some HTML and can do pretty good design to actually brand the cloud without learning all the SharePointy stuff that has to go along with it. Um, one thing to note, we uh, branding is still a journey. Um, SharePoint doesn't really make it any easier, um, and it's not really any, uh, I guess it, it's a little simpler to do things uh, today in 2013 than it was in 2007. But this doesn't uh, stop, in my opinion, anybody from following the good guide to branding, which is, you know, having that project sponsor um, and laying out your site map architecture as a second step. Uh, once that person is done and sponsored and giving you a vision of what they're after, um, once you've got your site map architecture, you really need to lay out a content architecture. What types of content will live on each page? Are you planning on any custom web parts? Is this going to be a publishing page, a team site? Etc. There's a lot of out-of-the-box layouts 
Um, but there's many times that you want to create custom templates or page layouts to meet the needs that are required for your content. So that requires some pretty specific planning. Um, obviously, the, after you've got a good idea on your current content architecture, you want to get some wireframes. So you can document, um, you know, the design process, make sure everything is valid. And then, you know, you have a clear draft of where the items will be placed on a page and how much space you're going to cover. Obviously, it's not a mock-up, but it's a wireframe. And then this is something that you take back to your project sponsor and say, hey, what do you think of this? And then they're going to it's, – it's basically a layout, right? And they're going to, like, I like this. It's good. It's bad. They're going to give you, you know, some good feedback, hopefully. Um, and there's a lot of good – tools for wireframes. I like to ha I happen to use Balsamic. I like that a lot. There's also Axure and there's uh, Just in Mind as well. Um, you just obviously some free, some I think, I think Balsamic's like 80 bucks, but it's worth every bit of that 80 bucks because those wireframes are very interactive and you can actually click through them and show them off to your project sponsor or your project sponsoring team so you can uh, make, get a good feel of how things are going to work. It's not just a bunch of static files and sites and pages. So um, after you've done with the wireframes and those are approved, it's time to create the mockups. And then everybody knows what that means, cranking up Photoshop or getting your designers involved and making and bringing that uh, that wireframe to life with the colors, the graphics, the pictures, and the actual content, you know, that, that would sh how it would look on the page when it's rendered with everything intact. And then once the uh, once that's approved, obviously you slice up that, that PSD and turn it into – you know, your HTML, CSS, which you can then take that piece and then you can upload that to SharePoint. There's obviously a lot of steps to go through to do this right. Um, obviously, you can hack it up real quick for quick proof of concepts and different things, but highly recommend going through the actual steps to making sure a good branding uh, project is successful. And then the biggest step in all of this, honestly, is, is the testing, especially with the mobile uh, penetration today. We mentioned that earlier of how important it is. You've got to figure out what browsers you're going to target. You've got to figure out what devices you're going to target. You've got to figure out your usability. Um, if you've got any scripting in there, you've got to make sure that that code in your script is going to work across those different devices because they they do have different uh, events and click events and different things that you have to be aware of that are not cross-platform necessarily, that are specific for that stuff, and then they have to make sure that everything works together at the end of the day. It's very easy to make something work on a, on a regular phone and break it on an iPad, for example, or vice versa. And then, you know, obviously the last step in anything is, is training, because you created this beautiful thing, but if you aren't taking the time to properly train your administrators or power users or your champions, um, you're going to see less of a user adoption than you probably wanted to, um, and that's usually not a good thing. So we've got a couple more questions up here. Uh, our company has acquired license for SharePoint. From where can we get from your website, learn the basics on SharePoint Designer? So we don't necessarily have a B&D uh, website uh, area dedicated to the basics on SharePoint Designer. If you want to send me an email from the contact information, I'd be happy to provide you some links on the basics or we can maybe set up a little uh, go-to web meeting or something like that and go through them together. I'd be happy to do that for you. And another question, can you send a link for any SharePoint Basics designer? Yeah. So, again, if you guys could send me an email on that, it's on the contact page. I'd be happy to, to send you the link from the Basics. And I will check with our marketing department to see what we can put up with uh, – we always archive these webcasts on the website, so I'll see if we can put some links up there for the basics on, on SharePoint Designer and um, some other things. Obviously, there's a lot here to think about uh, when it comes to branding. This, they, they didn't make it uh, so easy that you don't have to actually plan and uh, execute on that plan for your organization. So there's still a lot to do when it comes to branding. Nothing there has really changed, and it's not really any easier than it was, except for the ability to upload and have SharePoint consume it. There's still a lot of steps and a lot of thought and a lot of best practices that have to be employed to make that branding journey a successful one. So I will, uh, I think I've covered pretty much everything I wanted to cover, and I'll leave the call open here for another like five, ten minutes to see if any other questions pop in. I'll just put myself on mute, and if I get some more questions, I will jump back on. Thanks very much for joining today, everybody. Appreciate your time. And if you have any further questions, please uh, feel free to see, send me an email or hit me up on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to help. Thanks again.